You can tell I am not Josh. Josh is in the Dominican Republic right now with my husband Jeff and actually our son looking at opportunities for partnering in missions down there. And so that's an exciting trip. They'll be back tomorrow night enjoying the warm. Uh, as it relates to missions, next week is our noisy offering. So if you were here uh, about a month ago, that we had the kids come down and collect all your loose change that we also give to local missions agencies. So if you want to partner with us next week, make sure you gather up your change, maybe spend some cash. I always use my debit card, so I got to go search for change in the house. But make sure you come prepared next week for that. Uh, the other announcement that we have is our women's retreat has about two or three slots left. So if you are interested in that, we'd love to have you. Um, you can register, follow the instructions in your, pro excuse me, in your program. So that's coming up. And then college students, last announcement. If you want to go home for uh, a meal with a family here at church, that is on March 3rd. And so instead of eating here, we're sending you out. We had about 40 of you do that last fall, and it was super fun to do. So reach out to me, catch me after service, or put it on a connection card, and we'll set you up with a family that knows how to cook, because we have a lot of those here. So if those are the announcements for this morning. And if you don't know who I am, most of you do, but I am April, and my position at the church is connections director. So um, adult discipleship and college, and then first impressions are kind of my areas of responsibility. And once in a while, filling in for Josh when he is gone. So here we are, the last week of the series, I Just Can't Blank. And if you are like my husband, he said, I just can't handle this anymore, right? I mean, that has been it. Last two weeks on forgiveness on admitting when we're wrong, on not judging. These, this is a heavy series. This is the last one of that. So next week you can come back and maybe just enjoy and not be necessarily convicted. So um, we're going to do this morning on I Just Can't Handle Criticism. A lot of titles for this sermon. I just can't handle criticism. I just can't overlook an offense. Uh, I just can't shut my mouth. These were all the working titles, but we landed on I Just Can't Handle Criticism. Um, the Bible has a lot to say about that. Proverbs 19.11 says, People with good sense are slow to anger, and it is their glory to overlook an offense. I think 95% of us don't believe that's true anymore. You don't have to spend more than five minutes on X, formerly known as Twitter, to think this is not true. We don't believe this. We believe it is our glory to defend ourselves and to counterattack. Like, that's where we live as a society now. And I think most of us, that's our gut reaction. Don't let anybody put you down. Don't let anybody do X, Y, and Z. You need to defend yourself. And there is a place for some of that. But I think there is also a place for handling criticism well. So this summer, if you read through the Bible, you get to the book of Esther in August. And uh, this summer I was reading the book of Esther. And, you know, if, you're, if you grew up in church, you read that book. And you think, if you're a young girl, you're like, that's who I would be. I would be Esther. And we're going to get into that story, but Esther is beautiful, and she saves her people, and she's amazing. Or maybe you're thinking, if you're a guy, you're Mordecai, who refuses to bow to something he shouldn't. Um, and so these are the two heroines. It is, like, seriously the best book in the Bible, if you like things to end nice and tidy, which I do. I am not somebody that likes movies that end badly. They should, the bad guy should get it, and the good guy should win. That's just how it should be. And the book of Esther is exactly that. But as I was reading that summer, I, it really taught me something because of something that happened um, about handling criticism. So I'm going to give you some background. I'm just going to assume you haven't read Esther in a while, or maybe you've never read it. So we're going to jump into the story. You're going to land in chapter 5, and we're going to go from there, and then pull out the lessons on handling criticism. But for a little bit of background... The southern nation of Judah has been exiled to Babylon. And the Babylonian Empire fell, and then the Persian Empire took over. So this is about 100 years after they were exiled. And the story takes place in the capital city of Susa, about 480 BC, under the king Xerxes. Now, Xerxes has this party for six months with his 127 provinces. All the nobles come. He even tells the, the servers, hey, don't cut anybody off. They can drink as much as they want. So a six-month party. And at the end of the six months, he has a seven-day party for the people in the capital city. And then his queen also has a party for the women. At the end of those seven days, he says, and it says, when everybody had been drinking quite a lot, 
he said, hey, let's have my queen come in and show off. I want to show her off to all these guys. Now, any woman is thinking, no way. And that's exactly what the queen said. No way, I'm not doing that. So she refused to come. And then all the wise men said to the king, we can't let this stand. Because if she doesn't listen to you, our wives won't listen to us. No wife is going to listen to their husband and the entire empire. So they deposed Vashti and they sent out a decree to all the provinces that said all wives should listen to their husbands. So this is where we go. So then about oh, six months later, we don't actually know how long, eventually the king is kind of sad because he doesn't have a queen. So he says, all his wise men again say, let's basically have this massive beauty pageant and we will get all the most beautiful young women in the whole empire. Bring them to the capital. They'll have a year of beauty treatments and then you can choose a queen. So in this sweep of beautiful women, we meet Esther. And Esther is a young Jewish woman. Her name is also Hadassah. And she is being raised by her cousin Mordecai because her parents have died. So we have Esther. And she says so she's beautiful of form and face. Just a beautiful young woman. So she gets picked up to go for these beauty treatments. And Mordecai says to her, do not tell anyone that you're Jewish. So she hides her identity. So she goes in, eventually the king chooses her to be the queen. So she's elevated to this, to this role. And in the meantime, the king um, promotes this man named Haman to, to prime minister. And Haman is the bad guy. He's promoted to second in command of the whole country. And every day when he walks out, he passes Mordecai at the king's gate. And Mordecai will not bow to him. Everybody else will, but Mordecai will not. And we don't exactly know why. It doesn't tell us, but most people theorize that that second in command position included some kind of like acknowledging that you're divine. And since Mordecai was a Jew, he was not going to bow to that. So every day he refuses to bow. And it just stirs up this hatred in Haman. And he says, I'm going to take out Mordecai and every single Jew. So he rolls this dice. They're called Pur, P-U-R. And the plural for that is Purim, which is why we still have the festival of Purim, which Jews celebrate all over the world. So he rolled this dice to get the right day to eliminate all the Jewish people. He goes to the king and says, hey, I would like to wipe them all. And if you let me do this, I will contribute to the treasury 375 tons of silver, which he assumed he would get from confiscating, confiscating Jewish property. And the king, which I don't know, this guy's quite interesting, this king, he says, don't even worry about the money, do what you want. So they send out this decree that all the Jews are going to be exterminated on this date. Mordecai, obviously devastated, all the Jews are devastated. He hangs out at the gate in mourning clothes. Esther hears about it, sends him some clothes and says, hey, you don't dress better, basically, not really, but she's worried about him. And he sends back and says, you have to talk to the king. You have to talk to him. And she says, I have not been called to the king for a month. And anybody that goes to the king without being called, it's a death sentence. And this is where we get the famous line. He says, don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief from the Jews will arise from some other place. But you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. That's the most famous verse in the book of Esther. For such a time as this, you were put in this position. So she says, okay, get all of the Jews in the capital city to fast for three days, and at the end of three days, I'll go in. So she goes to the king. He extends his scepter to her, which means she's not going to be killed. And she says to him, come to a banquet at my house tonight with Haman. He says, okay. So they go. They have this banquet, and he says, okay, what do you want, Queen Esther? I'll give you anything up to half your kingdom. And she says, uh, I don't want anything except that you come back tomorrow night, and then I'll give you my request. Okay, so this is where I want you to jump with me, if you would. Chapter 5 of Esther, verse 9. So they have this banquet, and it's just the queen, and it's Haman, and it's uh, the king. And it says, when Haman left the banquet, he was happy and in a good mood. But then he saw Mordecai at the entrance of the palace. And when Mordecai did not rise or show any sign of respect as he passed, Haman was furious with him. But he controlled himself and went home. Then he invited his friends to his house and asked his wife Zeresh to join them. He boasted to them about how rich he was, how many sons he had. He had 10, by the way. How the king had promoted him to high office and how much more important he was than any of the king's other officials. 
What is more, Haman went on, Queen Esther gave a banquet for no one but the king and me, and we are invited back tomorrow. But none of this means a thing to me as long as I see that Jew, Mordecai, sitting at the entrance of the palace. So his wife and all his friends suggested, why don't you have a gallows built 75 feet tall? This is quite the wife and the friends, right? We're going to build a gallows 75 feet tall. Tomorrow morning, you can ask the king to have Mordecai hanged on it, and then you can go to the banquet happy. Okay, so Haman thought this was a good idea, so he had the gallows built. Now, your translation may say gallows or it may say a pole. And actually, the Persians, this is not the American West. It wasn't probably a gallows where you hang somebody by the neck. It was probably a pole for impaling people. So pretty graphic, right? So 75-foot tall pole at his home that he was going to impale Mordecai. Chapter 6. So that night, the king can't sleep. And since he can't sleep, what's more boring than having the royal records read? So he gets somebody to read the royal records. Sure enough, in the royal records, it says Mordecai prevented an assassination plot. And he said, what have we done for Mordecai? And they said, we haven't done anything. And the king said, well, who's in the palace right now? And they said, Haman just came in. And Haman had just come to ask the king for permission to hang Mordecai, to impale him. And he says, Haman, sorry, the king says to Haman, what, there's someone I wish very much to honor. What should I do for this man? And Haman thought to himself, who could the king want to honor so much? Me, of course. So he answered the king, have royal robes brought for this man, robes that you yourself wear. Have a royal ornament put on your horse. Then have one of your highest noblemen dress the man in these robes and lead him mounted on the horse through the city square. Have the nobleman announce as they go. See how the king rewards someone he wishes to honor. And then the king said to Haman, hurry, get the robes and the horse and do this for Mordecai the Jew. I mean, can you imagine that? I'm humiliating. So Mordecai does that. He runs home and his wife and his friends say, oh, this is not good, Haman. The tide is beginning to turn and you're going to fall before Mordecai the Jew. And right as they say that, the palace eunuchs come and take him to the second banquet. So at the second banquet, the king says to Esther, what do you want? And Esther says, if it please your majesty to grant my humble request, my wish is that I may live and that my people may live. My people and I have been sold for slaughter. If it were nothing more serious than being sold into slavery, I would have kept quiet and not even bothered you. But we are about to be destroyed, exterminated. Then King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, who dares do such a thing? Where is this man? And Esther points to Haman. Our enemy, our persecutor is this evil man, Haman. Haman faced the king and queen with terror. The king got up in a fury, left the room, and went outside to the gardens. And Haman could see that the king was determined to punish him for this. So he stayed behind to beg Esther for his life. He had just thrown himself down on Esther's couch to beg for mercy when the king came back into the room from the gardens. And seeing this, the king said, Is this man going to assault the queen, even right here in front of me in my own palace? No sooner had the king said this than the eunuchs covered Haman's head, and then one of them said to him, Hey, Haman even went so far as to build a gallows at his house so he could hang Mordecai, who saved your life, and it's 75 feet tall. Hang Haman on it, the king commanded. So Haman was hanged on the gallows that had been built for Mordecai. Then the king's anger cooled. So the rest of the story, Mordecai gets promoted to Haman's position. You can't undo a law that is sent out, so he couldn't undo and say, hey, we're not going to have that day, but he changed, he added an additional law that said all the Jews could defend themselves. So it ended up being this huge victory for the Jewish nation. So that's where the story, where the story goes. And like I say, every time when I read the story of Esther, you would go, yes, that's who I would be. Of course I would be Esther. Of course you would be brave, right? Of course you would defend your people. But this summer, somebody came into my office, a very wonderful person, and they had some critical things to say, mildly critical. Just like Mordecai, they weren't cruel. They weren't destroying my reputation in public, I don't think, anyway. I mean, they're just a great person, but they simply did not bow to me. They simply didn't say, April, you're amazing, and everything you do is amazing, and all the decisions you make are amazing right? They had some things to criticize. And I, like Haman, went from in a good mood to instantly offended and instantly hurt and instantly angry. 
And I thought, since I had just read the story, I'm like, oh my word, I am not Esther, I'm Haman. I'm the bad guy. That's awful. This is why you don't read the Bible. You never get convicted if you don't read it, right? <laughs> so I thought, I am Haman because what do I want to do? I want to do exactly what Haman did. I want to walk out of my office and I want to go to my coworkers, call my husband and say, can you believe this? Which is exactly what Haman did. Walks out of there, gets his friends and his wife and says, can you believe this? Look who I am and this man will not bow before me. I mean, it was shocking to me to go, oh my word, that is exactly what's in my heart. The same kind of response that was in Haman's. So I want to tell you at least what I have learned about handling criticism. Now, luckily for me, I had just read the book of Esther, so I did not do that. But not to say I haven't in the past, and I imagine you have been in the same boat. So I'm going to give you some steps, and we're going to kind of use uh, the framework of going to court. Uh, Darwin Van Dievender, we have a lawyer here in, in our audience, and I asked him, what do you need for, to, to sue somebody? He said, 200 bucks and a bad attitude. <laughs> Most of us have that, at least the bad attitude. So we're going to look at what, what we would do when you want to defend yourself and you have taken offense. What do you do? So the second title of this sermon is How Not to Get Yourself Impaled. Okay? So we're going to give you steps to not get yourself impaled by overlooking criticism. So step one, I think you need to identify the offense. So Esther chapter 5 verse 9 says, Haman left the banquet. He was happy and in a good mood. But when he saw Mordecai at the entrance of the palace, and when Mordecai did not rise or show any sign of respect, Haman was furious. And that word furious is burning rage, wrath, venom, poison. I mean, it's just a nasty word. Haman was, went from a good mood to furious in a matter of seconds. Now, I imagine some of you have gotten a text or an email or a comment that have taken you from a good mood to instantly angry or instantly hurt. I imagine it doesn't take very long for you to remember an instance like that. So before you say a word or do a thing, I think we need to stop and analyze what is this emotion telling me? And if it's a two offense, and this woman who, sorry, it's a woman, now you know, but anyway, this person who talked to me in my office um, was kind. She wasn't, even, she wasn't even really, it was actually a great conversation. But it was a two offense, and I reacted at a nine. So it's my responsibility to say to myself, where did that seven come from? Where did that seven come from? Tim Keller has said before that anger is always defense of something you love. So it can be righteous anger when you're angry that somebody has hurt somebody you love. It can be unrighteous anger when you love your honor or your position or your approval. In his book, Relational Spirituality, Todd Hall says, emotions provide a powerful source of information because they're processed automatically and outside of our direct control. He didn't choose to be angry. He was angry. Our emotional responses provide the clearest window into the deepest level of our soul, the meanings we connect to relationship and to events. We cannot manipulate the emotional meaning we assign to events, so they reveal what we really believe at a gut level about ourselves and about others. So, they, so if you are instantly angry, you have to ask yourself, what do I believe? Like, what, has, what nerve has been hit? And sometimes you have to take that to prayer and ask God to help you because it's difficult to identify that. But if you can identify that emotion and say, what do I believe? That may be enough right there to overlook the offense. Do I believe nobody has the right to criticize me? Do I believe that I'm perfect? Do I believe that, that I, everybody has to agree with me and that I'm less of a person if they don't? If I get down to those things, often it's enough to let the criticism go. But step two, most of the time, I think we're offended because we forgot our position. We're either insecure about our position or proud. So remember your position. In Esther 3 verse 1, it said, Haman, sometime later the king promoted Haman over all the other nobles, making the most powerful official in the empire. All the king's officials would bow down before Haman to show him respect whenever he passed by. So for the king had for so the king had commanded, but Mordecai refused to bow down or show him respect. Okay, so look at this. He has the respect of the king. He has the second position in the whole 
empire. Everybody bows down to him except one man. Haman had the approval of the king, and the disapproval of one man is enough to bring him down and destroy him. How many of us has that been the case? Maybe you have a family that loves you, a spouse that loves you, and one comment is enough to derail you for weeks. Or get inside your head, or get inside your heart, and maybe for years. I think it's because we forget that we have that position with the king of the universe. Romans 8, 14 said, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves. Remember, slaves have to earn it. A slave has to earn an approval by what they do. You, does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And if we are God's children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. So we are children of God. Kids don't earn their position. In fact, when our daughter was adopted, we didn't say to her, hey, once you really start acting like a dice, then we'll make you a dice. No, we said, you're in, and let's go from there and begin to be part of a family, right? Nothing you can do can earn that, and nothing you can do can lose that, because you are a child. You are not a slave. So I think when we can't handle criticism, we forget our position. We're insecure with our position, because if you believe you earn it, then you can't handle hearing somebody say, you're not doing a good job at that. You also, though, some of us need to remember how we got to that position, I have always loved um, Keller's definition of the gospel. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. Right? We are both at the same time. More loved and accepted as a child of God and also a mess. So there's really nothing to be too proud of. If you need something to memorize, Ephesians 2 is an amazing passage. But God is so rich in mercy, verse 4 here, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all that he has done for us who are united in Christ. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you cannot take credit for this because it is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So nothing we do, we didn't earn it, right? It says... You can't take credit for this. It is a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things you've done, so no one can boast. If we live into that, we can handle criticism. Because we really don't have anything to be proud of. In, uh, I taught at an academy up north, um, Sacred Heart Academy, and we had this one particular uh, family with two girls. This family was loaded. Um, I mean, when the, first, when the oldest daughter turned 16, she got a summer Porsche and a winter Lexus. Yeah, and you might have seen what I drive, so there may have been a little jealousy um, there. But these two girls, I'm not kidding, were pretty awful. They were proud, condescending, I mean, just nasty to other kids. If you happen to give them a 96 instead of a 98, you were getting a phone call from the parent or there was going to be a conference with that, with that kid. And so I wanted to say to them, why are you so proud? You didn't earn any of that. You didn't earn the money for that Porsche or that Lexus. Right? Those clothes you're wearing, you didn't earn the money to buy those. Those are all a gift from your parents. You are a trust fund baby. And I had heard somebody say, that's what we are as Christians. We are trust fund babies. And I love that picture. God's so rich in mercy. We are examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness. We are trust fund babies. We have no reason to be proud. 
Charles Spurgeon once said, if anyone thinks ill of you, don't be angry with him, for you are worse than he thinks you to be. And isn't that true? You are worse than he thinks you to be. So when somebody criticizes, can we say, okay, my ego is not on the line. I know who I am as a gift from God, and I'm walking in that love as a child of God. So when we forget that, it's easy to be offended and hard to overlook. So step three, beyond that, if you identify the offense, if you remember your position so you're not insecure or you're not proud, you get to step three, get the right defense attorney. I know we've all seen the shows where the judge says, who's going to defend you? And the guy goes, I'm going to defend myself, right? I have never seen a TV show where that goes well. Always a bad idea to defend, to be your own defense. But this is exactly what Haman does. He invites his friends in Esther 5 verse 10, and he says, he boasts them how rich he was, how many sons he had, how the king had promoted him, how much more important he was than any of the king's official. And what's more, Queen Esther gave a banquet for no one but the king and me. So Haman goes to defend himself. But that is not our responsibility. So when we look at the Old Testament, we see David, who has every reason to defend himself. God said, you're going to be king, but he didn't become fully king of the entire nation for 14 years. And he is being persecuted. He is being chased by Saul. And he, over and over in the Psalms, looked to God for defense. Psalm 26, 1, vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in integrity. Psalm 43, 1, vindicate me, O Lord, and plead my cause. Psalm 35, 24, vindicate me in your righteousness, Lord my God. Don't let them gloat over me. Psalm 7, verse 8, vindicate me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and my integrity. Psalm 54, 1, vindicate me by your power. And Psalm 37, 5 through 7, commit your future to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act on your behalf. He will vindicate you in broad daylight and publicly defend your just cause. So over and over, David goes to God. He doesn't go to his friends for vindication. He doesn't go to his coworkers or even his spouse. Those people can go for it. You can go for encouragement. But it is not their job to be your vindication. That is God's job. And 1 John 2, 1, it says, My dear children, I write to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate or a defense with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Notice it says, I'm going to be your defense. Jesus will be your defense, not only when you've done the right thing, but when you've done the wrong thing. He is our defense. That it doesn't have to be us. We can trust God to be our defense. We can trust that we have a defender in Christ Jesus. So my dad was a pastor for 40 years, and one of the great pieces of advice he gave me is, when you get criticism, he said, I would always take it to God, and I would say, God, help me to remove the emotion Help me to see what's true in it, and help me to chuck the rest. Wise advice, because sometimes the criticism you get, if you can step back, remove your pride or remove your insecurity, sometimes it's true. And isn't that terrible? Like, that's the worst. But sometimes it's actually true. And so then you can move from that and ask God to be your defense. So step four, trust the judge and obey the gag order. And boy, this is hard. So Esther chapter 5, verse 14. So his wife and all his friends suggested, why don't you have a gallows built 75 feet tall? Can you imagine this meeting? Because I cannot imagine this. I can't imagine Jeff coming home and say, this happened. I'm like, yeah, let's build some gallows. (laughs) Right? I mean, it's pretty aggressive. Yeah, let's take them out. So, and remember, all that Mordecai did was not bow. He didn't plot to kill Haman. He didn't hit Haman. He wasn't physical with him. All he did was refuse to honor him in the way he thought he should be honored. Haman thought it was a great idea, so he had the gallows built. But we don't build gallows today, physical gallows. But man, I think a lot of us build gallows with our words. And we hang people's reputations on them. Boy, I've done it, and I'm sure you've done it. In James 4, it says, Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. 
There is only one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? When we gossip, we judge and we punish. And when we gossip, especially as it relates to criticism, we make our own gallows and we hang people on them. How many of us have done this? in our homes, in our offices, in our, in our dorm rooms, on social media. I bet there's a few of us that have hung a coach or two on some gallows after a bad game or a bad meet. How many of us have hung a pastor? One of the families said to my dad early on, I just want you to know, Pastor Chuck, we're never going to have roast pastor for lunch. I thought that's actually a pretty kind thing to say, right? But how many of us have hung a coworker or a roommate or a brother, or a sister, or someone in your church family. I think all of us have done it. All of us have built those gallows and hung somebody's reputation. According to Matt Mitchell, the sin of gossip is bearing bad news behind someone's back out of a bad heart. Bad news behind someone's back out of a bad heart. Just in case you don't know this, it is gossip even if it's true. You know, sometimes with young people, they'll say, well, if it's, it's not gossip if it's the truth. No, it still is. If you are bearing bad news behind someone's back out of a bad heart, you are gossiping. And we have to remember in the Bible, uh, God has issued a gag order. We don't get to try the case in the court of public opinion. But so often we do this because we do not trust that God will take care of it. If I don't take care of it, no one will know and they will not get justice, Right? So I'm going to make sure it happens by destroying their reputation instead of trusting that God will do that. Because, but in the Bible, we have options. We can go to the person. We can go to God. We can go to advice at, for, for advice if our heart is in the right place. But we need to examine our motives. I just need to vent. Most often translates, I just need to punish someone for how they made me feel. But that's not our role. We're not the judge. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor. A German pastor was actually killed under, uh, in Nazi Germany. But he says, in community, we often combat our evil thoughts most effectively if we absolutely refuse to allow them to be expressed in words. What if we stopped right there before we said anything and took it to God? What would happen if we did that? Now, I'm talking about criticism here, but if it's something that rises to the level that needs to be addressed, we've just had two sermons, right, on what to do with forgiveness, how to do that. And you got five steps last week, right, on forgiveness. But I just want you to notice that gossip was not one of the five steps. It's not in there. Step five, last step. So, after you have identified the offense, remembered your position, ha after you have gotten the right defense attorney and trusted the judge, step five, you want to save yourself and those you love from getting impaled. Somebody's getting hurt. And so often when we are judging and punishing others, it is us that is hurt. On Legacy of the Heart, Wayne Mueller said, as long as we hold on to how this or that person hurt or dishonored us, we are trapped in a dance of suffering with that person forever. We have a relative that's in Costa Rica that has a hurt that has destroyed his family. He has not been back to the U.S. in, I think, 40 years. And every time he gets sad, it goes right back to that hurt. And it has kept him in a dance of suffering for 40 years. But look what happened in the story of Haman. Haman is impaled on his own gallows, but we find out in Esther 9, all of his 10 sons are too. I have seen so many families, especially of pastor's kids, where an inability to overlook criticism and going to the children for defense or vindication has ruined children's relationship with the church. Because it's like you gave this kid a rock to carry, and they don't know what to do with it because they can't go to the person because they're not the injured party. But now they just get to carry this rock. And it's devastating and it's so hard and it has made difficult for the rest of their life to interact with the church. Just want you to remember that vindication is not your coworker's job. It is not your kid's job. It's not even your spouse's job. 
they get to defend you, or sorry, they get to encourage you, but you don't have to go to them for vindication. So, as we close, are you Haman or Esther or Mordecai? Do your kids or your friends or your spouse or your coworkers pay the price? Do you spend your evenings or your car rides building gallows? And I think if any of those things are true, you, we really forget who we are in Christ. Um, Jeff and I had an Airbnb before we moved here. We had a lady that stayed with us. She's about 35 years old. And when she stayed with us, we had just been into the adoption process with our youngest daughter about two years. And so I said to her, knowing how important it is for a child that's adopted to feel part of the family, to attach to the family, I said to her, how long did it take for you to feel like you were part of the family? And she said to me, she said, she's 35. And she said, you know, I had amazing Christian parents amazing Christian parents, but I never felt part of the family, and I felt all growing up, if I ever did anything wrong, they would reject me, and she said, I knew it wasn't true, but I could not get over it, and I think that is how we feel about our relationship with God. We can't afford to do anything wrong because we feel like we're earning his love and his approval. If we know where we are, we are loved and part of the family of God, then we can handle criticism, and in those moments when we forget that is when that criticism can be devastating. We go through life vindicating ourselves, justifying ourselves, defending ourselves, forgetting that in Christ we are already vindicated, already justified. In Christ we're defended. In Christ our sins have been judged, and in Christ we walk free. Because he was hung on the cross. He was hung on the pole. We don't have to be. Taking our punishment... But because of our position as an heir, we are all those things and more. And only then can we overlook offenses. It's really cool that in ancient uh, Rome, you didn't adopt because of the need of the child. You adopted because you had something to give, an inheritance to pass along to somebody, and you had no child. And isn't that the picture of God? Has all of this incredible wealth, all these riches, that he's wanting to give to us as his heir, co-heir with Christ. So, this week as you go, when somebody says to you something to you, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You're going to identify why it hurts. You're going to take it to God. You're going to ask him to defend you. You're going to be reminded of your position. And hopefully you're going to trust God to be the judge and save your family, your friends, from the consequences of holding on to offenses. Would you pray with me? Father, we can call you Father as your child adopted into your family, not because of anything we did, but because of what Christ did for us. Help us to live into that reality, neither living in fear of losing our position or pride in thinking we earned it. Free us from the need to be our own defense and help us to leave that in the hands of Christ. Help us to allow you to be judge and free us from the desire to judge and punish others by our words. Help us to know what offenses need to be addressed personally and which simply need to be overlooked. Thank you for being our defense, our judge, our vindication. And thank you for taking our punishment on the cross. We love you and we praise you. Amen.
bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken and great are you lord it's his breath it's your breath in our loves so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our
Father